I'm Vinny Politi, and thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. It's great to have you with us. You know I've been covering trials for a long, long time. Court TV and other places through the years. Big ones, local ones, ones that made uh, national news, ones that were um, super high profile. But in my career, I've, I've never covered a case that is as divisive as the trial we are covering right now on your front row seat to justice. The case against Kyle Rittenhouse, who shot three people, killing two, in the middle of the riots in Kenosha. This is a case where people I have on the show, people I talk to about the case, um, people on social media making these comments, people are dug in. And all of us have been looking at pretty much the same thing now since this happened in the summer, since the summer of 2020. And, and we're looking at the same exact video and people are seeing two exact opposite things happening. Some people see murder and it's awful and he is evil and this kid is, is, is just, he should be thrown away for the rest of his life. And you've got other people saying, this is what self-defense is for. This is what it's about. When someone's attacking you, trying to take your weapon, this is why you're allowed to defend yourself in this country. So, ultimately, it will be up to a jury to decide which side uh, is seeing it correctly according to, to the verdict. But we're not there yet. Today was opening statements. And what was really interesting was the contrast in the opening statements. Because the prosecutor got up there and, and told their story and then sat down. And then the defense got up and told their story much differently. Because this is a case where there are dozens of people recording everything that's happening, including the FBI, who's above in their, in their airplane with their infrared cameras. I mean, everything's being recorded that happened. There are still pictures. There are freeze frames. There are videos. Um, and the defense decided to show them to the jury in their opening statement. Prosecution objected, but we've seen it dozens and dozens of times in courtrooms around America where videos and pictures are shown during opening statements. So that's how they told their story. I want to show it to you tonight. Take a look. Mr. Rittenhouse was the only person who was chased by Joseph Rosenbaum that evening. This is Joseph Rosenbaum. Mr. Rosenbaum was at a location, and Mr. Rosenbaum, along with other individuals, started a dumpster on fire. And when somebody put that dumpster that was very close to a gas station out, Mr. Rosenbaum became enraged. This is Gage Grosswitz, the individual who is the victim, or excuse me, the complaining witness in count five. I apologize. The next photograph. Gage Grosswitz running down Sheridan Road, and you see his hand going into the back of his waistband, pulling out a firearm to arm himself. The evidence will show that that yellow dot right up there is where Kyle Rittenhouse is as they chase him down Sheridan Road. At this point, he is unarmed. Kyle does not point a firearm at him, does not do anything to dissuade him from approaching him. You'll hear on the video the exchange, and you'll see it. Hey, what are you doing? You shot somebody? Who shot? Who shot? Hey, stop him! This is a picture of Anthony Huber, the individual who attacks my client as he's laying on the ground after being kicked in the head by Jump Kick Man with his skateboard. Ladies and gentlemen, I would love to be able to hold up that skateboard in front of you as evidence today because then you could see it. You could see the weight and the heft of what a skateboard is. And what that skateboard would do is somebody takes it in their hand and swings down on somebody's shoulder, head, and neck. Bare hand pulling the gun towards him. Jump kick man getting up to run away. 
can see a close up, the bare hand on the gun. Kyle Rittenhouse flat on his back in the most vulnerable position one can be in. You can think people are labeled Richard McGinnis, Richie McGinnis, and they head down. You see Mr. Rosenbaum come around from hiding in the cars, beginning to chase my client. You'll see the flash of the firearm from Mr. Savitsky, and you'll see the flashes of his first shots. When Mr. Rosenbaum is shot in the car source lot three, there's been a gunshot behind Kyle. He turns to address Mr. Rosenbaum with his firearm. Mr. Rosenbaum is not deterred. He continues to run. You'll see that on numerous videos, closing the distance. Mr. Rosenbaum could have stopped at any time. Mr. Rosenbaum is wearing that maroon shirt on his face as a mask, covering up his identity because he wants to steal my client's firearm and use it against him to carry out the threat he had made earlier. I need to stop them! I do not hear to stop them! Dominic Black, I believe, will testify that he saw him. He was white as a ghost, sweating like a pig, and he was explaining what happened, saying he had to do it. It was self-defense. Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who's joining us from Kenosha, Wisconsin. He was inside the courtroom today, obviously outside tonight. Um, Chanley, can you take us inside the courtroom for the two opening statements, the prosecution and the defense, and describe how each one, were they different? Was there a different vibe in the room? Was it... Because from where I was sitting, it was like two completely different approaches to doing all this. One where I'm there, the other one I'm kind of hearing a story. Right, and it felt that way inside the courtroom. First of all, the jury, I'm impressed at how attentive they were all day long, Vinny, but especially with the prosecution having the first word. Of course, they're going to be real attentive, paying attention, following along. But I noticed a stark difference when Mark Richards of the defense took over and implemented and incorporated the visual elements to his opening statements. The videos like you just played, the photos, identifying who Joseph Rosenbaum was, what he looked like, Anthony Huber, Gage Grosskreutz, all of those key things. I mean, you could tell this jury was following a story, hanging on every word he was saying inside the courtroom. Not to say that the prosecutors wasn't effective. It certainly was. He also told a quick snapshot of a story real vividly at the beginning of his opening and then went back into more detail. But it was that visual element of the defense me that I thought really made an impact inside the courtroom. And, and, and the prosecutor seemed to be surprised that the defense was going to use these exhibits during their opening statement. That's right. In fact, when the jury was out of the room, there was a pretty big break between the opening statements, Vinny. The prosecution objected to the fact that the defense wanted to use the visual elements and even had to put on the record what the defense was going to use in its PowerPoint slide. There's a huge television in front of the jury box. They had moved that. That alerted the prosecutor to ask, what are we going to show this jury? Nothing has been entered into evidence yet. Well, the defense stood up and listed about 41 different exhibits, photos, a, a part of this slide, and the judge overruled the prosecution, allowed them to use it during their opening statements. In fact, the prosecution said, look, we're going to have a trial. Why have the trial in opening statements? He said, I didn't know we were going to do all of that when I gave mine. We've, I, I mean, call me crazy. I've been doing this for uh, a lot longer than you have because I'm older than you. That's the only reason, Charlie. But I mean, <laughs> Even in the last three years, how many times have we seen attorneys using exhibits, especially videos and recordings and photographs during their opening statement? This is, I mean, this is pretty standard in the trials that we've covered. 
Absolutely. We see it all the time in opening statements, and it's really a way to grab the jury's attention. And a lot of times you have a motion in limine that asks the judge for permission to use certain elements in your opening statements to make sure that's all hammered out before this day arrives. That was not done in this case, obviously, and we've scoured through the court file. That was not done, but we know it was done in the Maude Arbery case that we're also covering. They had the prosecution gaining permission to use that viral video in opening statements. So it's so common, Vinny, it surprises me with these experienced prosecutors and attorneys here that they did not uh, plan ahead a little bit more today. Yeah, and, and we're, maybe it's just the local practice that they don't do it, and all of a sudden someone comes in and does it. Uh, let me ask you one, one more thing. I'm going to bring in the think tank, but I have more questions for you. Um, of all the videos and, and photographs that we saw today, some of them were new to me. Were there any new ones that you saw today that really uh, kind of struck you or you saw a reaction inside that courtroom from, from the jury? You know, what stood out while the videos were playing, first of all, the jury closely watching, almost scrutinizing videos as they were played on the screen. Vinny, I noticed that, all of the videos really, but also the defendant Kyle Rittenhouse would lean in to a big screen on defense counsel table and also watch and scrutinize videos. And at times he would even look to take in jury reaction. He took notes throughout the day. That stood out to me, but there was a key video. I think we played it in the mashup right before uh, you came to me, and that was video from the perspective of Gage Grosskreutz. I hadn't seen that before, when actually he's running and they're chasing Kyle Rittenhouse down Sheridan Road, the road that's r literally right behind me here. I have car source, I can see car source lot right here, Vinny, where I'm sitting. So that's the video I hadn't seen, that perspective, that's pretty powerful. And that's something these jurors, and probably just the tip of the iceberg of what they will see that we haven't even seen yet. All right, Chanley, stand by. I want to bring in the think tank, get some reaction on this issue. Joining us tonight in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, Albert Wunsch III, in Seattle, Washington, trial attorney, Ann Bremner, and in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, former federal prosecutor and law professor at Texas Southern University, Michael Sterling. Great to see everyone. Al, I want to begin with you. Um, seeing these videos and these pictures and the way they were laid out by the defense, I think they are now ahead in this case on day one because they really told their story today. No doubt. No doubt. It was a spectacular opening by the defense. It was a phenomenal opening by the defense. The opening by the prosecutor was so lackluster. It was boring. Okay. It, I mean, I don't like the, the rooster hairdo. And the situation throughout was just, he didn't even put the victim's pictures up. To, to show, I mean, like the one thing about the prosecution is supposed to engender sort of like feelings and emotions for these two people that were killed and one guy that was, was wounded. And there was nothing, there was no connection made to this jury. Whereas the defense just kicked butt. It was a phenomenally put together production. And shame on the, the prosecution for not being at that level. It, these guys are superstars, absolutely superstars. And Bremner, another way I gauge reaction is just from people who've actually been, you know, know about the story and cover the story. And a lot of them were saying after the opening statement of the defense, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know right. that. And, and, and that's kind of what you want in a high profile case like this, where everyone's been exposed to some of it in Kenosha. Well, absolutely. So those surprises, Vinny, are huge, you know, for the press and big for the jury because the jury has been exposed to some of this already, of course, in a small town. But the um, the other thing is, is that I was thinking, this judge said I've been around for 50 years and photos have always come in an opening statement. I remember when I was a baby prosecutor, it made the Seattle Times that I had put in a video in an opening statement. That's how you know different it was. That was a long time ago. I'm a lot older than you, Vinny. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, this is standard. It's absolutely standard. And now the prosecutor is saying, oh, I wish I could have done that. If I knew they had 41 exhibits, visuals, then I would have done the same thing. Too late. Michael Sterling, I want you to take a listen to uh, the prosecutor, Thomas Binger, here. I'm going to play um, two parts of his, his opening statement, a couple of statements that he makes, just so we have a little something to compare it to, okay? Let's watch. Here's the prosecutor. But out of the hundreds of people that came to Kenosha during that week, the hundreds of people that were out on the streets that week, the evidence will show that the only person who killed anyone was the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. 
The evidence will show that hundreds of people were out on the street experiencing chaos and violence, and the only person who killed anyone was the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The evidence in this case will show that on the night of August 25th, 2020, here in our community of Kenosha, the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse, who was 17 years old at the time, had armed himself with an AR-15 style semi-automatic rifle loaded with 30 rounds in the magazine. And using that rifle, he shot and killed Joseph Rosenbaum, an unarmed man. The shot that killed Mr. Rosenbaum was a shot to the back. This occurred after the defendant chased down Mr. Rosenbaum and confronted him while wielding that AR-15. All right, Michael, what do you think about the, the, the contrast between the, the video presentation and, and the prosecutor? I mean, it seems typical to me, Vinny. Uh, defense lawyers are, are oftentimes far more colorful uh, in their description of events, far more, you know, uh, uh, artful, bombastic, uh, you know, really drawing on things uh, to, to bring out certain um, uh, uh, instances and facts they want the jury to pay attention to. And prosecutors typically are sort of just the facts, ma'am, just the facts, sir. Let us tell, let us walk you through a series of facts. And so oftentimes you'll see defense lawyers and you'll be amazed at their lawyering and be wild by their lawyering. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get you to victory, right? The idea is that the prosecutors have several charges they have to prove up. It isn't just the homicides here, but it's uh, about five or six other charges uh, that they have to prove up. They have to walk the jury through those and do it as they pay attention to what the jury instructions are going to be at the end. And so they've got to they've got to really, really hone in on those facts. And so what I what I see is a typical difference, a, a more prepared defense you know, in terms of uh, presentation and prosecutors who are sort of saying, hey, here are the facts. Let us lay out the facts. Uh, you know, just pay attention to the facts. Yeah, my takeaway from all of this, though, it was, and, and the feeling I got was, prosecutor did a nice job. I, you know, he's, he's he's obviously very experienced and and is very comfortable inside that courtroom and easy to listen to. But I felt like after the defense went, it was like, all right, guys, well, here's the rest of the story. Here's the stuff he didn't want to tell you. Here's the stuff he didn't want to show you. And that was just the feeling I got. I don't think that was his purpose. I don't think he's trying to hide anything. But that was the, the overall impact, I think, in the contrast from my perspective. All right, Think Tank staying with us the whole hour. Chanley Painter's going to stay with us uh, as, as well.